Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and welcome to the Gaming Rules Games of the Month video log for May 2023. In this video, I'm going to be covering all of the games that I've played over the last month, whether they've been in person with other people around the table or online using various online gaming platforms. Then I'm going to give you a channel update, what's coming new to the channel, and all of the usual stuff. A big warm welcome to everybody who is new to watching these video logs, and I hope you enjoy them. But I started off the last one with an apology, and I'm going to start off this one with an apology as well. This is a different kind of apology. Uh, I wrote this video log yesterday. I'm actually recording this on the very last day of May 2023. It's the 31st of May today. I leave for UK Games Expo tomorrow. Uh, I wrote this video log yesterday, and I had lots of enthusiasm yesterday, and I thought, great, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, uh, and I'm going to film the video log, and I'm going to get it edited, and then I'm going to pack, and I'm going to head off to UK Games Expo, and everything's going to be great. And then yesterday I went to the dentist. Now I went to the dentist to have a crown refit because uh, about a month ago a crown fell off, not in any pain whatsoever. Um, it fell off and I just needed to go back to the dentist to get it put back on. Now I've not been to the dentist for a couple of years uh, and my dentist has changed. It's a new dentist so he did a full checkup and during that checkup he had a bit of a prod around and let's just say I was in the most pain that I've been in for a very 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 long time as he prodded something which he shouldn't have prodded. Um, I say he shouldn't have prodded. Uh, basically, I've got a cavity in my wisdom tooth at the back and he touched it and wow, I was in a lot of pain. I'm still in a lot of pain. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to soldier on through this. I woke up this morning thinking after about four hours sleep thinking I can't do the video log today. I can't do the video log today. But I really want to do this video log. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I if I'm less enthusiastic than normal. Now that I'm talking about games, I feel all enthusiastic again, but I've spent the last 12 hours just in pain, feeling absolutely awful. So there we go, let's get that out of the way. Right, okay, let's crack on, first of all, with all of the games that I've been playing. Now, the last video log actually went out at the start of this month, um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna cover all of the games that I've played, and this might be the first time this ever happens. I'm gonna cover everything I've played from the 1st of May, Right on, th right on to the 31st of May, because I'm not going to be playing any games today. I don't think I'm playing any games today anyway. Um, so, yeah, let's crack on. And first of all, we're going to talk about Arkham Horror, the card game. I've played this four times this month. The 2nd, the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th. And these are all live streamed on the channel. So what we're doing is Emily is coming over every Tuesday night, and we are live streaming our plays of the Edge of the Earth campaign. This isn't the most recent campaign from the Arkham Horror card game. The most recent one, I think, is Scarlet Keys. Uh, it's one from a couple of years ago, but I've never played it. This is our first time playing it, and we are five chapters in. So, as I say, we're playing it every Tuesday, although Emily couldn't make it on the 9th um, of May, so we, we skipped that one. But they're all on the channel. If you're interested in checking them out, uh, I would warn you, though, that there are spoilers, okay? Uh, Arkham Horror, the card game, is a very narrative-based, story-based card game. Uh, and if you don't want any spoilers, then don't watch the videos. But if you have played through The Edge of the Earth and you want to see us playing it, then, then go and check them out. Um, my thoughts on the Arkham Horror card game, I have talked about this a number of times. Uh, and I could probably do a review video of it. I've got enough thoughts on this game in order to be able to fill... A 15 minute review video easily because I've been playing this game for years. Uh, I love the game. It's arguably possibly in my top 10 games of all time. I mean, I always joke that I've got 50 games in my top 10 games of all time and it, it might not make the top 10, but if it doesn't, it would probably make the top 20. Absolutely love the game, even though this game has at least three core mechanisms which I hate in games. It has the fact that you have to commit cards to a test to influence the chance of that test working or not, and then you draw a token out of the bag to see whether it actually works. It's effectively roll to resolve, but instead of rolling a dice, you're drawing a token out of the bag. That roll to resolve is not one of my favorite mechanisms in games. Also, committing cards before you do the test is also not one of my favorite mechanisms because you might end up committing a load of cards and then failing which means the cards were wasted, or you might end up committing a load of cards and you would have passed anyway, which means the cards are wasting. What you're doing is by committing cards in advance is you're, you're manipulating the odds. Uh, and as a 
pure Euro game player. Ah, that's a lie. I'm not a pure Euro game player. As somebody who enjoys Euro games, um, those mechanisms don't sit well with me. The other big issue with the game, and I'm saying it's a big issue with the game, but I love the game nonetheless, is the fact that your deck of cards contains equipment that you should be carrying in your pocket. And it's just one of those, it's, it's just the way the game works. You build your deck with your allies, with your, uh, you know, your coat, your boots, your gun, all of the equipment that you're going to be carrying with you actually goes in your deck. And you might draw it and you might not. And it's just thematically nonsense. The fact that you're at the end of the adventure and you're like, oh, oh, here's my gun that's been in my pocket for the whole time. Love the game. The narrative is brilliant. It is so well written. The stories are so enjoyable. And the entire game is extremely thematic, except for the way that the character decks work. But that's just it. And I, I, I don't think I'll ever say no to a game of it. I love the game, despite its flaws. Right, moving on. Speaking of another thematic game from Fantasy Flight Games, May the 4th is Star Wars Day. And each year, Rick comes over, uh, unless there's a global pandemic, um, and we get together and we play Star Wars games. And the plan for May the 4th was that we were going to play Star Wars Rebellion in the morning, and then we were going to play Star Wars Outer Rim in the afternoon. Now, we did play Star Wars Rebellion, and if you're interested, it's on the channel. In fact, there are two Rebellion playthroughs on my channel. There is one for May the 4th, 2022, uh, where me and Rick played it over Tabletop Simulator because I'd recently had COVID and it was not safe for Rick to come round. So we played, so we did we, we did Star Wars Day on May the 4th over Tabletop Simulator and we played Star Wars Rebellion. This year, however, neither of us had COVID. So Rick came over and we actually played the physical game. Now, Rick, this is Rick's copy of the game and he's never played it. He's got the game uh, and never played with a physical copy. Uh, so that's on the channel now. If you want to go and see that, just search for Star Wars Rebellion on my channel. And it was live streamed on the 4th of May, 2023. What do I think about the game? I think it's utterly fantastic. I have heard so many good things about Star Wars Rebellion since it came out. Um, I'm not sure if it is still in the top 10 games of all time on Board Game Geek, but it always, it always confused me a little bit why a game like that, not really knowing much about it, um, was in the top 10 games on BGG. And then I played it and I realised why. It is an utterly, incredibly well-designed game. And talk about thematic, it's one of the most thematic games I've ever played. For those people who don't know, it basically sort of follows the story of the original Star Wars trilogy. So you start off with the Rebels on a secret base uh, and they're plotting and they're doing all sorts of missions, trying to steal Death Star plans, do all of this. The Empire is growing in force and trying to find the Rebel base and everything else. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just great. Uh, I'd love to be able to play it again. I'd love to be able to play it more so that I get a little bit more comfortable with the rules. I won't spoil how that game ended uh, for those people who do want to go and watch it, uh, or if you just want to go and watch the end of the video to see how it ended. But yeah, that was, that was Star Wars Rebellion. Then we were going to be playing Star Wars Outer Rim. However, what happened is the Rebellion game took a bit longer than expected. I was thinking, oh, we might be done by maybe one o'clock. Um, and then we can have a bit of lunch and then we can play Star Wars Outer Rim in the afternoon. However, the Rebellion game took us until about three o'clock in the afternoon. So we thought, oh, okay, right, let's let's have a change of plan because Rick had to leave at like 4.30. Let's play Star Wars the deck building game instead. We'll be able to get a game of that done. So I took the Outer Rim stream down, sorted it out, changed it. Then unfortunately, Rick had a phone call and he needed to disappear because uh, one of his sons had to be sent home from school. So instead, I went back upstairs and I played Star Wars Outer Rim. I did a solo playthrough of Star Wars Outer Rim, um, which was utterly fantastic. I mean, right now, I'm sounding like one of those reviewers who absolutely loves everything because <laughs> I've played Arkham Horror the Card Game. I've played Star Wars Rebellion. I've played Star Wars Outer Rim. Star Wars Outer Rim is one of my favourite games. Um, and again, it is another game which has mechanisms in it which you think, Paul, why are you enjoying this game? It has dice rolling for the combat. Um, but everything about Star Wars Outer Rim, the way that it plays, the the, the feel of the game, uh, the, 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 the fact that you're a mercenary and you can pick up these jobs and you can go hunting bounties and you can do all of these different things. Absolutely love it. It is made better with the expansion, but I am a strong believer that the base game was very, very, very good, even without the expansion. The expansion makes it better, but 
the argument of is the expansion necessary? No, the expansion is not necessary. You can play the base game absolutely fine without the expansion, but the expansion makes it better. And that's the same with Star Wars Rebellion as well. A lot of people say that the Star Wars Rebellion expansion is essential. Essential for me means you cannot play without it. Now, you cannot play it without it and should not play without it are two very different things. Both Star Wars Rebellion and Star Wars Outer Rim, the base games work fine, but both of them are better games with the expansion. Right, next up. On the 5th of May, I did two solo playthroughs of New York City. Now, one of these is on the channel and the other one was done as a practice game. So this was a sponsored playthrough. I have to say, everything that I've talked about so far are videos on the channel, none of which were paid for by the publishers. Uh, this one was. So this is a solo playthrough of New York City, which is game number three in the Steffenfeld City Collection. And I've made an agreement with Queen Games that I'm going to be doing videos uh, for all of their games in the Steffenfeld City Collection. I'm doing how to play videos for each of them. I've done playthrough videos last year for each of them. And I'm doing solo playthroughs for the ones that have a solo mode, which is Hamburg, Amsterdam, and now New York City. Uh, and that's on the channel now if you want to see that one but I will give you my honest opinion on it, even though that was a sponsored playthrough. So, first of all, the solo mode for Hamburg, I have to say, I was a little disappointed by. The solo mode for Amsterdam, I was also a little disappointed by. The solo mode for New York City was very, very good. Now, to be honest, full disclosure here, not many people will realize this, but the solo mode for New York City, which is a Steffenfeld designed game, is actually not from Stefan himself. It's actually from a guy called Ralph, who works at uh, Hall Games. He's the owner of Hall Games, who publish games themselves. But he's also a game developer. He does a lot of work with Stefan. And he is a friend of mine. But I only found that out after I'd read through and played the solo mode. <laughs> when I spoke to Ralph and he went, yeah, I kind of designed that. And I was like, oh, right, it's really good. So the reason why the solo mode for New York City is really good is it basically is a set of rules to allow you to play one of the players as a bot. Or should I say one or more of the players as a bot. So if you wanted to, because New York City is a game that has area control as one of the core mechanisms, and area control games tend to not work with a low number of players. Now, actually, in New York City, it worked fine, but you could play the solo game of New York City with three bots if you wanted to. Uh, the bot is called Tom for Automa. So you could play with Tom number one, Tom number two, and Tom number three, which is always funny when Tom from Slicker Drips always does a solo playthrough where the AI is called Tom. Uh, I'm sh pretty sure he changes it to Marty, but it would be quite funny to see Tom playing against Tom. Um, anyway, the other good thing about the, the, the Automa is that it has 12 different configurable dif difficulty settings on, on how it works. Um, and it was relatively easy to maintain. Those of you that watch my channel a lot will know that I struggle with complex uh, automas, and this one was manageable. It was it was fine, no problems with it whatsoever. Um, yeah, it was well within my sort of comfort zone. Uh, and it's quite clever in the way that it, it has a decision tree on does it play these cards and everything else. Um, so yeah, that was really good. If you are interested in solo modes at all, definitely check out the solo mode for New York City. If you've got the game and haven't tried the solo mode, have a look at it. But also, as I mentioned, the solo mode is actually rules for how you simulate a dummy player. So if you're playing a two player game of New York City, you can add in one of these automas or you can add in two of them. And if you're playing a three player game, you could add in one of them. And I think that's what I'm going to do. The next time I play this game, if I play it two or three player, well, maybe not three player, but certainly two player, I'm probably going to include the rules for one of the automas. Um, yeah, really, really good. Really enjoyed that. Next up, on the 6th of May, me and Vicky played the Cantaloupe prequel. Now, Cantaloupe is a series of puzzle style, um, point and click adventure style games put in a sort of board game form, although it's not really a board game, it's more a book that you read through. Uh, published by Lookout Games, I've heard lots of good things about these over the years, but I've never actually got to try them. Now, me and Vicky like escape room style games. We love the exit games, the unlock games, and, and all sorts of other ones. More on that later. Um, but the Cantaloupe, we'd 
never actually played them. Now, on their website, they have the demo. Or it's actually a, called a prequel. So if you're interested in checking it out, go to the Lookout Games website, and on there, you will find the Cantaloupe prequel. And you can download it. And it's basically a sort of uh, mini adventure that takes place before the Cantaloupe stories. Um, and we played it, and we really enjoyed it. Now, I grew up playing point-and-click adventures. I still like playing point-and-click adventures now. Me and Vicky recently played the uh, Return to the Secret of Monkey Island, or the Secret of Monkey Island, uh, the, the redone version or something like that. So yeah, I like point-and-click adventures, and it works really well in this game. They have managed to transfer those mechanisms into a board card game format, and it just works really well. Um, now, the prequel, the one thing that did surprise us is it actually took us about an hour and a half to play. So it's not just like a quick 15 minute demo, it's actually a full blown mission and adventure. So yeah, don't don't sit down and think, oh, we'll print this off, it'll take us 20 minutes to play. No, it's actually a good solid length. The last puzzle was a bit weird and we did not work it out and we basically had to look up answers for that one. Um, but yeah, Cantaloupe. Uh, since then, Lookout Games have kindly sent me Cantaloupe 1 and Cantaloupe 2. We've not got around to trying them yet. They are up there, but I'm very much looking forward to it. I've heard the first one is brilliant. I've heard the second one is not so good. So we'll find out. Moving on to other Escape Room style games. After we'd played that one, uh, me and Vicky were going through my uh, hobby room where I store my games collection, and I'm having to make room for other games. A load more games have arrived, and every couple of months I have to move about five to ten games out of the main games room into what I call tertiary storage, which is basically like death row, um, because what's going to happen is those games will eventually then get given away, put into a charity raffle or something like that. And we were looking through all of the games and deciding which ones I'm probably not going to play again, and we came across Mystery House Adventures in a Box from Cranio Creations. I got this at the S and it came out and we played the first scenario and we were a bit eh, on it. But the game only comes with two scenarios. So we said, I tell you what, rather than taking it and putting putting it into the attic, let's play it. So on the 7th of May, me and Vicky played uh, Mystery House Adventures in a Box Chapter 2 or Adventure Number 2, Scenario 2, whatever it, whatever it was. And we both really enjoyed it. So suddenly that game is like, oh, okay, this was actually really good. Now to give you an idea of what it is, uh, the box for this game is actually used in the game. What you need to do is you need to raise it up. We, we have a Lazy Susan, so we raised it up to eye level. And what you do is you open up this adventure pack and you literally slot in cards. I'll see if I've got a photo of it. If I've got a photo of it, I'll put it on screen now. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you slot in cards into slots in the box, and then you look through the edges of the box, or the edges of the box are all open, so they're like windows. And what you do is you look through and you go, oh, there's a door there, I can't get through that. Oh, there's a window there, I'll look through the window. Oh, I can see something inside. And basically you solve puzzles and it is, it's an app-driven game, uh, and it will say, oh, such and such a door opens, remove card J6, and you slide out card J6, and suddenly you can now see more. Um, it's just a really clever idea, and it worked really well. Not too complicated either, um, in terms of how difficult are these puzzles? You know, because some of these puzzles, like I mentioned, the cantaloupe, the last puzzle was so baffling we didn't get it. Uh, the ones in Mystery House are pretty okay. Yeah, they're no, not too light for us. They're a good level for us. So that was that. We enjoyed that. Next up, sponsored content again time. So Apex Legends. Apex Legends, the board game. Now... Glass Cannon Unplugged are a relatively new publisher. They've had one game published so far, which was Frostpunk, and I have a professional relationship with them. Uh, I worked with them on Frostpunk. I spent 18 months of my life, I think, writing the rulebook for them. I did the official how to play video for the game, and I've built up a good working relationship with them. Apex Legends, the board game, is their next game, which is actually on Kickstarter right now. So if you're interested in it, it's based on the uh, very popular computer game IP, which is a kind of um, battle royale first person shooter style game. And they contacted me about it and they said, Paul, we want you to cover this game because you covered Frostpunk and everything else. Uh, they wanted me to work on the rulebook for the game as well, but I don't do rulebook editing anymore. I am doing a little bit of consultancy for them on the rulebook, but I'm not actually writing the rulebook. 
Um, one of my uh, friends and patron supporters, another rulebook editor, Miguel, he's the he's the main editor for the rulebook and I'm kind of working with him on it a little bit. Um, but in terms of the game itself, they contacted me about it and I said, look, okay, Frostpunk was different. Frostpunk is a board game based on a very popular computer game. It happens to be my number one computer game of all time. Well, it was my number one computer game of all time. Uh, Surviving Mars is probably my number one computer game of all time, as I've been playing a whole lot of that in the last 12 months. But anyway, Frostpunk is my number two favourite computer game of all time. So when I found out there was going to be a board game version of it, designed by Adam Kwipinski, who I'm a fan of, I was, I was all over this. Apex Legends, however, I had absolutely no interest in whatsoever because I don't play. The last time I played a first-person shooter game was probably Unreal Tournament in about 2001. Um, I don't play those games. I don't have any interest in playing those games. Um, and in terms of playing board game versions of those games where we run around and shoot each other, no, it's not for me. Now, I'm not a... I, I don't play miniatures games. I don't play Warhammer. I don't play... Um, you know, Star Wars Legion or Marvel Crisis Protocol or anything like that. And I've got friends that play those games, but I don't play those kind of games myself. But they said, Paul, just give us a couple of hours. We'll show you how the game plays on Tabletop Simulator. We'll give you a demo of it. And then you decide if you want to cover it or not. And I said, OK. And then I played it and I went, yes, I want to cover this game because I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's just as simple as that. I went into it thinking, OK, I'll give them a couple of hours of my time and then I'll turn around and, and say, thanks very much for showing me the game, but it's probably not the kind of game that fits me or the channel. Good luck with it, but let me know when you've got your next game. Because I'm not just somebody who says yes to every piece of work that comes in. I want to only try and cover the games uh, that I, I really want to cover. Now, in the past, going back two, three, four years ago, some of the games that I covered then are like, oh God, why did I cover this game? But now I'm trying to be a bit more critical. But anyway, I played it and I really, really enjoyed it. So I went back to them and said, yes, I will happily do some coverage for you for this game. So let's get back on to where we are. On the 11th of May and then the 12th of May and then the 13th of May and the 13th of May again, I did four playthroughs of Apex Legends. Now, only one of those is on the channel. And the reason for that is, well, the other three are on the channel, but they were Patreon only because they were behind the scenes footage of me learning the game, practicing playing it, practicing teaching it. And all of that was all in preparation for the live stream that we did, which is on the channel now. If you want to go and check it out, it was a live stream on the 13th of May. It was Saturday afternoon. Um, <clears throat> JP and Adrian came over from the Whose Turn Is It Anyway, anyway podcast. Uh, and Mark Monk came over from Ninja Geek Gaming. And quick shout out, Mark has got a review video of this game, which is going live today, I think. So whereas I'm not going to give you, although I just said I did a tabletop simulator playthrough and really enjoyed it. Um, forget that. Moving on. Um, I'm not going to give you my full opinions on this game because I was asked to create the video. It was a sponsored video. That was a paid promotional video that I did. I focus on the instructional part of the game, the rules of the game, and showing you how the game plays to help you make a decision about whether it's the kind of game that you want to play. It is very clear, however, from that video that we were all enjoying it. That is something that none of us can fake. I can't anyway, no matter how much money you pay me or you don't pay me. Um, whereas Mark's video, Mark wasn't paid anything. I think I bought him lunch, but other than that, He's not paid anything for it. So if you want to get Mark's honest opinion on the game, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video as well. Um, but yeah, that's on that's on Kickstarter right now. And if you are like me and you think the idea of a Battle Royale style first person shooter board game is of no interest whatsoever, just have a quick look at it. And if it is something that you're not interested in, that's fine. But my tastes over the last few years have been not changing they have been widening so 10 years ago i would be playing the dry boring euros where we move cubes about and we'd have no player interaction and i'd love them and i would not really want to be involved in any games where there's like fighting or dice for combat or anything like that now i enjoy certain games in that genre i still like the dry boring euro so my tastes haven't changed as such they've just become wider and a bit more is eclectic the right word 
don't know, if it is, eclectic. Right, so that's uh, Apex Legends. Next up, another sponsored playthrough. This is War of the Three Sanchos. This is the latest game uh, in the Pocket Campaigns series from Surprise Their Games. It started out with Cousins War, uh, then it was the Ming Voyages, the March of Progress, and now game number four is War of the Three Sanchos, designed by David Mortimer, uh, published by Surprise Their Games, so game development from Alan Paul. Um, and that's on the channel soon. We recorded the playthrough on the 19th, uh, and that has been recorded. I've got the footage. I haven't edited it together yet, uh, but that will be coming to the channel sometime, I believe, in July. I think it's going to be going to GameFound. Um, I think it's GameFound. Um, and it's going to be going live probably the middle of July. So watch this space for that one. Um, and again, because that was a sponsored playthrough, I probably shouldn't give you my completely honest thoughts on it, uh, other than it's my favourite one of the four. Um, I do enjoy. I did enjoy Cousins War. I thought Cousins War was uh, was an extremely clever, clever little game. Um, Ming Voyages I enjoyed as well. Didn't enjoy March of Progress so much, but this one, this is my favourite one of the four. It's a it's a one to three player game, and it works well at all player counts because there are rules for how you automate the other players. It's basically three cousins fighting over Spain in the eleventh century. Um, so it needs the three players, but it doesn't need three real players. Uh, if you see, it needs the three Sanchos, it doesn't need three players. Um, there'll be more on that later on, as I say. The video will be coming out in July. If you are one of my patron supporters, you had access to watching us play the game, uh, and you could see how it played out. But in that video, I do a, a, a teach of the game, and, and then we play through it. Also, on the 18th, just going back a day to the 18th, so I played War of the Three Sanchos at the Rock Beer Gaming Group on the 18th of May, and also on that night we played My Abbey. Uh, now, My Abbey is a game designed by Michael Kiesling, a very famous designer, and he's done a lot of very good games over the years. And My Abbey is from about two or three years ago, actually published by Haber. Now, Haber have uh, a lot of children's games in their catalogue. That I, I always thought that they only really did children's games, but actually they've done a few games that are not children's games, and My Abbey is fantastic. It is a Euro, uh, it's relatively simple rules, but quite deep uh, in, in the gameplay compared to the rules complexity, uh, and it's just an extremely good game. You're basically building up a Zen garden, but it's very clever on, okay, I'm gonna take a tile and I'm gonna place it in this column, Right, that means I can't place anything else in this column this round. Oh, okay, well, that where am I going to put that one then? It's this little spatial puzzle that you're trying to do yourself, and it's just absolute solid game, really easy to teach, possibly a gateway plus game. Yeah, it might be a little bit too much for a gateway game, but if people have played it once already, if people have played you know, other gateway games, then My Abbey is definitely a, a next step forward. Great game, really, really enjoy it. Uh, so that's my Abbey. Then Space Core. Now, I've been a fan of Space Core. Uh, this is Space Core 2025 to 2300 AD, designed by John Butterfield, published by GMT Games, came out in 2018. I've recently, GMT Games kindly sent me the expansion for the game um, because I've been after playing this game again for at least two years and finally got a chance to play it again on the 19th of May, and this is on the channel. This is a live playthrough on the channel if you're interested. We did not use the expansion, which was I was going to use, uh, because the other two players were new. So yeah, we didn't use the expansion, um, and in fact we said at the start of the video, we'll show you the expansion at the end of the video, and we didn't. We forgot, because uh, it was a very long stream. <laughs> we were still here at midnight, but it was epic. I, I, I think it's a great game. In fact, back in the day when I used to do reviews of board games, I have done a review of Space Core. So if you are interested in my extended thoughts about the game, go and check out the review video for Space Core, which I might try and remember to put a link to in the description of this video. Um, as I say, I, I think the game is great. There's a couple of issues that I have with the game that I still have with the game uh, now. And this issue raised its head in our game. There's so much of this game that is great. It's a Euro game. It's very clever in the mechanisms in the way that it works. It's very streamlined. It plays very smoothly. However, there is this bit of a random element in it which can absolutely throw the game off completely. 
And that unfortunately happened in our game. Now, I've spoken to a number of people about this and there's been a number of articles about it um, in that there is a couple of tiles, really nasty tiles that some people remove. And I didn't remove them because I wanted the other two players to have the, the true experience of the game. And unfortunately, Pete came across one of the really nasty tiles and it just absolutely crippled his game. Uh, the next time I play, I am probably going to take that tile out. I, I probably am just because it can lead and it did lead to a negative play experience. And especially when you're playing a game for four or five hours and it's all going okay and you're planning everything and then you draw one tile and it totally and utterly messes everything up. It's just the way it is, just the way it is. So 98% of that game I think is beautiful and perfect. And then there's this little 2% extra that just kind of ruins it a little bit, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but anyway, that's Space Cool. That was not sponsored. Just, just to clarify that, that was not a sponsored video. GMT sent me a copy of the expansion for the game, but I wasn't paid any money for creating that video. Speaking of videos that I wasn't paid any money to create, the next one is a little bit special. Uh, and this is War Room. We live streamed this. No, we didn't live stream this. Yes, we did. Uh, the 20th of May, Saturday, the 20th of May, Vicky was out for the day. So I got some friends over and we played War Room. This was live streamed to Patreon supporters. But then what I've done is I have edited the video and I have re-uploaded it and that is on the channel now. Now, why is War Room a bit special and why am I covering it? Because this is a war game and I don't cover war games. Well, I kind of do a little bit. Going back to the 80s, one of the first games that I played and a game which I still have very, very positive feelings about, even though I probably would never play the game again, is Axes and Allies. So back in the late 80s, when I was getting into gaming and I was playing 1830, Acquire, Axes and Allies, McMulty, things like that, you know, oh, and Civilization, Advanced Civilization from Avalon Hill or Gibson Games. Um, Axis and Allies is one of the games that I played and I played it a whole bunch, loads and loads and loads of times. Um, and Axis and Allies has been a successful game for many, many, many years. Now, Axis and Allies ultimately is a World War II themed war game with lots and lots of dice rolling. War Room is by the same designer. It's effectively Axis and Allies version two, right? There are similarities to Axis and Allies. There's a lot of similarities, but it isn't just... For me to say it's a version 2, you might go away thinking, oh, it's just Axis and Allies revised with a few tweaks. No, it's a completely different game. It's a lot more complex than Axis and Allies, and there's a lot more going on than Axis and Allies, but you will see the similarities in there. It actually uses a dice system for combat, which is a little bit like Star Wars Rebellion, um, and it's one of the best combat systems that I've seen for a dice-based system in a game. It was just incredible. Adrian's got a copy of the game. I don't own the game myself. Um, and since he mentioned that he's got a copy of it, and since I, I learned about this game and I went, well, look, this is from the designer, Larry Harris Jr., the designer of Ax uh, Axes and Allies that I played loads and loads and loads in my younger days. Let's give it a go. Let's arrange a date and let's get this on the channel. And we did. And we actually played two games of it that day. So... We spent all day playing it. We did the North Africa campaign in the morning. Then we had a break for lunch. And then we did the War in Europe game in the afternoon. Uh, the Africa game was live streamed to Patreon supporters. So if you're a Patreon supporter of mine, you can watch that video. The War in Europe one is the one that we then edited and I re-uploaded later. And that is on the channel if people want to watch it. Now, if you do watch the video, I have to tell you, and I'm really sorry that I, I forgot at the start of the video to say please turn on your Klingon subtitles for any corrections. And I, I must remember to keep doing that at the start of videos because unfortunately it turns out we missed a very big rule. And that is the Stalin rule, which Adrian found later in the rule book on page 24 after somebody who watched the video and said, yeah, I think you've missed the Stalin rule from the rule book. And Adrian went away and, and found the Stalin rule. He said it wasn't in the best place in the rule book. Um, and it meant the, the things we were doing in the game, which is basically Britain and America flying their planes into Russia to help protect uh, the Russian area, you can't do that. 
The Stalin rule prevents them from doing that unless Russia's morale is really low. And, and that's what we did. So we got, we got the rules of the game right apart from that one. And that one meant we weren't able to do some of the things that we were doing. That affected the balance of the game. Uh, but we all enjoyed it. We all really enjoyed the game. The one thing that I've taken away from it, though, is one of the mechanisms of the game was stress. And this is a new mechanism uh, that's, that's new to this game. And the, the way that the stress works is if you lose one of your territories, you gain stress. And then the more stress you gain, the morale of your country drops and your people start going on strike and all sorts of things like this. And it sounded great on paper. It sounded great. This sounded realistic. It sounded thematic. It sounded like it would be really, really good. In practice, what happened is the stress levels just for Germany just went way too high. Now, bear in mind, we did get the Stalin rule. We, we missed the Stalin rule. We did get it wrong. But in a game, if you take over a territory, the player who owns that territory will gain stress because they've lost their territory. I get that. And that seems to make sense. And it's thematic. But then if you lose that, if they if they counterattack and you lose that territory from them, you gain the stress. And then if you take it back off them, they gain the stress. And something didn't quite sit well with me that Germany took over a territory. So Russia lost, uh, Russia gained stress for losing it. OK, that's fine. But then Russia counterattacked and pushed Germany back. And then Germany gained stress for losing the territory. We checked and we that's the way that the game works. But what happened in our game is because there was quite a lot of attacking and counterattacking, and there was taking of territory and retaking of territory, it meant that the German stress level just went so high, uh, the morale collapsed and it couldn't do anything. Um, now, now that we know that, and if we play again, we will remember the Stalin rule. And we will also remember that you don't just want to take a territory in this game. You need to take a territory and you need to hold it. Because if you don't hold it and you lose it, it's going to increase the stress and that's bad. Will I play it again? Yes, I will play it again. I'll definitely play it again. It's just a case of finding the time to do it. Next up, and that wasn't a sponsored playthrough, just so it's clear. Next up, also not a sponsored playthrough. This is Too Many Bones, um, the Automaton of Shale. We got together on the 25th and Ben came over, JP came over. It's JP's favorite game. Ben's played it loads as well. I haven't played Too Many Bones for over a year, which is shocking. Um, love the game, but just not played it in so long. Um, Chip Theory Games sent me a copy of Automaton of Shale and it's been sat there on the shelf, making me feel guilty. We finally got together and played it. Now, that video was filmed. It was live broadcast to Patreon supporters on the 25th and it's been edited and it's going live today. So by the time this video goes out, that video will be on my channel. If you are interested in seeing a three player playthrough of the Automaton of Shale, check it out on the channel. My thoughts on Too Many Bones, this is this was not a sponsored video. Uh, I've not been paid to create any content for Too Many Bones, as far as I remember, uh, by Chip Theory Games. So I can say what I want about the game. The game is a masterpiece. It is a work of genius. It is just absolutely incredible. And I know so many people who, for this is their number one game. It does have the same issue with almost every game from Chip Theory Games, is that every single time you play it, you are going to have to look up some rules because, well, how does that work again? And how does this work with that? And what about this? And what about that? Very rarely are you going to be able to play a game using the perfect rules because there's so many shorthand notations in the game that ha that are left open to interpretation. And that makes me a little bit uncomfortable, but having JP and Ben there uh, really, really helped the situation. But even then, there were two or three times in that game where we were going to the Discord channel to get answers. And thank you in advance. The, thank you for the people who helped us on the Discord channel. Um, but even then, one of the answers we got was then overruled by somebody else. So it's like, OK, so not even, not even the people there knew the exact answer to it. I mean, they gave us one answer, which we went, oh, yeah, that, that seems right. And then somebody else later on came and said, no, that's not how that works. And it's like, oh, it was the bribeable skill. And I've never come across it before. And it's really, really oddly worded to the point where it really requires, you know, another half a two paragraphs of text to actually explain how it properly works. Anyway, we finished it. 
The other disappointing thing with Too Many Bones is, and I've had this happen in a couple of games of mine, and if you are a Too Many Bones player and you're watching this video, let me know what you think about this. We had some epic fights in that game. Two or three absolutely epic fights. And then we got to the end and we set up the big boss and we just absolutely piled into them and killed them within a couple of rounds and then it's over. And all of the rest of the minions that you've got, all of the rest of the baddies and the enemies that are on the board, you don't need to kill them. Your objective is to kill the boss. And that's it. The tyrant, as it's called. Um, and there's definitely been a couple of games now that I've played of Too Many Bones, and I think the other two mentioned this as well, where you can just absolutely go all out for, for the tyrant, and if you kill them, you've won. And that's it. And the last fight felt like a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, it should have been the most epic fight of the lot. It should have been the toughest final battle and everything. And it actually wasn't. It was a little bit of a disappointment at the end. Um, I say disappointment. The game was great. We enjoyed the game. But in terms of, you know, having the final scene be the toughest fight yet, it wasn't. Right, next up. Another unsponsored playthrough, and this was an acronym. As voted on by my patron supporters, I had a free night on Friday the 26th, and we played an acronym. Now, this was live streamed to patron supporters on Friday. I have the video. It's ready to go live. I think I'm going to make it live um, maybe just before I go to Expo, or maybe on the Friday, just to spread the content out. Um, but an acronym. Now, Mind Clash games are one of my clients now. They weren't at the time. Anachrony is a game which I backed as a backer uh, and I bought the base copy of the game. But obviously since then, I've built up a good working relationship with Mind Clash Games. They're one of my favorite clients. Uh, they want me to constantly keep doing uh, videos for their games. I have a copy of Voidfall arriving tomorrow. I'm going to be working on that. But Anachrony, one of their earlier games designed by David Turtsey, covered that on the channel. It's been a while since I've covered that on the channel. Um, and David is a personal friend of mine, so just, just bear that in mind. But he wasn't at the time that I backed that game and I played it. I don't think I knew him at the time. But Anachrony is one of my favourite games. I love the game. I think it is an incredible game. I haven't really delved that much into all of the expansions. I remember playing Fractures of Time twice, but I've not delved into... Um, what's the new one called? Past, future, imperfect, imperfect, past, something. Anyway, that one. Uh, not played that one. I've not played the Expeditions one. I've not. I think I played the Doomsday Clock once. Um, there's so much content for this game. I've got the Infinity Box. It's there, in fact. There is the Infinity Box. Um, so we just played the base game because it was two new players. But I love the game. I love teaching the game. Uh, and that video will be going live. Uh, it will be going public on the channel on Friday. As I say, it was. Uh, we played it on the 26th. It was live streamed to Patreon supporters at the time, and the edited version is going to be going up this Friday. So that's an acronym. Next up, you're going to like this one. Finally, I have played Wingspan. So on the 27th of May, uh, Vicky was going out for the afternoon, and I was supposed to be doing some video editing, and I did the video editing, and then I went, I've probably got a couple of hours before Vicky gets home. Let's see which of my patron supporters are available to play some games with me online. So um, for those who don't know, my, my patron supporters have access to a Slack channel where we have lots of great discussions and there's a good community there. And one of the channels within the Slack is online gaming. And most of the games that we organize there are asynchronous games that we play on Board Game Arena or things like that. But sometimes people get together and we play live games together at the same time. Uh, chatting to each other on Discord. And I posted and I said, uh, I've got a couple of hours free. Who, who's up for playing a game? Uh, Elaine responded, Brett responded, Willem responded. So the four of us got together on Discord and we said, right, well, what are we going to play? You know, I'm, I'm happy to teach or whatever. And we had a chat for about five minutes and then somebody suggested Wingspan. Now, I've never played Wingspan. I do have a copy of Wingspan because I organise a convention once a year and I do the library for the convention, and Wingspan is a game that should be in every board game convention's games library, in my opinion. Um, but I've never played it. I've heard very mixed things about it. I've heard from some people it is the best game ever. I have heard from some other people that it is just... Eh. And I know other people who absolutely hate it. So I went into this game of Wingspan 
expecting that it was going to be an okay game because it can't be surely it can't be a bad game um i was expecting an okay game but nothing special that's that's what i went into it uh thinking now we played on board game arena um and willem did the teach and uh me brett and elaine and willem played it and i enjoyed it in fact i enjoyed it more than i thought i would and this is because i think i went in with very low expectations. Now I did just play the base game um, and we did use the variant onboard game arena to take out some power cards. Apparently there are a few cards that are just way too powerful and things like this. Uh, I'd also heard that the getting eggs strategy was a bit broken and way too good, uh, which got fixed in the expansions. But as my first experience of playing the game, I, I just enjoyed it. And I thought, I thought it was all right. I didn't do very well, but you know, I was making decisions. And I actually quite liked the core mechanisms of the game and the way that it worked. So much so that on the morning of the 28th, while I was in bed on the iPad, I decided to have another game of Board Game Arena, this time with some random strangers, which I don't normally do. Most of my games on Board Game Arena are played with people that I know, um, whereas sometimes I just join a random game with people. Uh, and yeah, I played another game of it. So yeah, I've, I've actually played Wingspan and I didn't hate it. So there you go. In fact, yeah, I'll, I might write to Jamie Stegmaier actually and, and, and say, if Jamie, if you want to use that quote, put that on the box. I, I think the next printing of Wingspan should say, I finally played Wingspan and I didn't hate it. Paul Grogan Gaming Rules. Yeah, that's good marketing, isn't it? Finally, just to wrap up all of the games that I've played with other people in person, not asynchronously online, is Mortem, Medieval Detective. And in fact... I should have spoken about this at the very start, but I've left it to the end because uh, Mortem Medieval Detective is published by Arcane Wonders. It is a very, very different style of game from anything else that Arcane Wonders do. Um, and it is, the, the base game comes with three chapters and there is a, chapter four is an expansion pack. Uh, so Arcane Wonders gave me review copies of these games. So thank you very much to Arcane Wonders for that. Um, but wasn't paid any money to play them. In fact, I didn't. These weren't live streamed. These, these were not live streamed on the channel. Uh, we played them over Skype, Zoom, Discord, Microsoft Teams, whatever, with Rick and Victoria. So me and Vicky sit here, uh, and we basically play with two other people remotely, with me sharing my camera so that they can read the cards and see what's going on. I've spoken about this before on the channel, um, but we've now finished it. So on the third of May, we played chapter three. And on the 27th of May, we played chapter four. It is very likely the third best narrative driven experience game that I've ever played. The first one being Tainted Grail. The second one being Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, The Green Box. And the third one being Morton Medieval Detective. We all really enjoyed it. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Chapter one was the only one that was a bit iffy because we were still learning the system. This, this game has made me want to do a review video again. I've not done a review video for about, I don't know, what, three or four years or something like that. This game makes me want to do a review because I can give you a full, honest opinion of this game. And it was great. And it was really good. And... This game is going to go under the radar for a lot of people. As I say, Arcane Wonders are not known. I think, I mean, they do a variety of games, but I don't think people are going to think this is a classic Arcane Wonders style game. And also, I don't know, there's just something about it. What I'm trying to say is this game, I think it's... What am I trying to say? This game isn't going to be as popular as I think it should be. That's what I'm trying to say. The game was really good, and I think most people have never heard of this game, and even those that have heard of it are probably put off from it or something like that. So what is it, for those people who didn't hear last time I spoke about it? It is a cooperative, detective-style game. It has, in fact, it has similarities to the detective game from Portal Games. But I didn't really like that one that much. 
this one is much, much better. It is set in a medieval world. It is a fantasy world. And one of the things that I really liked about the game is that the fantasy world that they've created is really good. It's kind of this mix of fantasy, supernatural weirdness. And it, it works and it does, it does it really well. And a lot of the theme of the setting comes across in the narrative, the way that you're meeting the characters, you're exploring, you're talking to people and everything else. The four chapters that you play are absolutely independent standalone adventures, but there is a story connection between them. You do not need to have played one before you play two, but you probably should because that will lead you into the story. You'll understand more about what's going on. And there are a couple of things that carry over from, from one to the next. But each individual chapter, the story was very clever. I loved the story because it wasn't just a simple, he's the good guy, he's the bad guy, she's doing this, she's doing that. All right, we've worked it out. There was twists there was plot within plots. There was somebody up to no good, but it wasn't linked to the actual adventure. But because you find out that they're doing bad things and they're doing, I don't want to spoil it, but you know, they're doing something that we, we all know is a bad thing. And it turns out, but then hang on a minute, they've saved one of the people that we're trying to rescue. Well, hang on, I, I, I thought they were the bad guys. Well, wait a minute, what's going on here? And it's really clever and the stories are really good. It's sad that it's over. I think there's only four of them. Uh, I think there's only the four chapters and I don't know whether there's going to be any more. I have sent Robert a message at Arcane Wonders to say, are there going to be any more of these? Because um, it would be a shame if there isn't. Really, really enjoyed them. Um, and basically the way that it plays is that you, you choose a location to go to and it costs you a certain amount of time and you track the time on the sheet. Uh, and then at night something else happens and you're reading, there's a lot of narrative, there's a lot of thinking, there's a lot of puzzle solving, but not puzzles like the escape room game. You're trying to work out who's doing what and where to go next. And then at the end, you get this series of questions. And the great thing with this game is that the questions are multiple choice. So you get 10 questions, they're multiple choice, and then you turn to the answer sheet and it will give you points based on the questions that you got right. And sometimes if you get, if you get the right answer, you might get three points. But if you got the wrong answer, but it was half right, you might get one point. And some of them, you might lose points if you get completely the wrong answer. Um, but yeah, really good system. Really enjoyed it. And probably not going to play it anymore because there aren't going to be any more. Um, but yeah, if you're local to me and you want to borrow it, feel free. Because this is a game which you might think, I've played it. What's the point in me keeping this game? The point in me keeping this game is I want to lend this game now to other people and get them to play it because it was a really good experience. Right, that's the end of all of the games that I've played with other people, sat around a table, mostly. <laughs> the next ones I'm going to talk about are the online asynchronous games that I have played. So these are predominantly on Board Game Arena, but some of them have been done with using uh, various apps. Uh, one of them is with the Terraforming Mars website, uh, the unofficial one. So I'm just going to run through quickly all of the games that I've played and I log them on the date that they're finished. So the games that I'm currently playing right now, they haven't been logged yet because I'm still I'm still playing them. So Ark Nova, played a couple of games of Ark Nova. Uh, Ginkgopolis, played a game of that on Board Game Arena. Russian Railroads, a couple of games of Space Base. No Thanks, Lost Ruins of Arnak. Uh, five games of Kingdom Builder. I got addicted to Kingdom Builder for a couple of days. Uh, a couple of games of War Chest. Teotihuacan, Newton, which is on Yucata. Uh, I played a game of just one with some complete strangers, which was very fun. Uh, I gave the clue Vanessa when the word was paradise. There you go. And they got it. Uh, and the game of Terraforming Mars. Right now I'm in another game of Teotihuacan, Terraforming Mars, Ark Nova, something else as well. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in about five or six online games at any one time, but they're the ones that I've finished playing over the last... Uh, over the last month. And I could talk about each of those, but I'm getting tired and I've got a lot of other stuff to cover. So let's move on to Hamlet week. Uh, gonna interrupt my normal schedule of things that I'm talking about to talk about Hamlet week. Hamlet is a game published by uh, Mighty Boards and they have asked me to get involved in Hamlet week. So Hamlet week started 
I think it started on Friday. And basically, uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of other content creators that are doing uh, live videos for it. I'm not doing any other live videos for Hamlet because I wasn't able to fit anything in this week. But Mighty Boards have kindly given me a copy of the game to give away to somebody. Uh, to enter that contest, I will put a link to it in the description of this video. Basically, you need to go and watch my video that I've already done on Hamlet. And there are a series of questions. Um, and the more questions you get right, the more chances you have of winning. And I will do the draw when I get back from UK Games Expo and somebody's going to win a copy of Hamlet uh, that Mighty Boards will send you. And they've said it's a worldwide delivery. So they basically, uh, they're, they're paying for this. I've not been paid any money for this. Just, just full disclosure, I'm not being paid any money for it. Mighty Boards are the one who are uh, obviously sending the game out. So it's going to cost them money. I'm just happy to help them uh, promote the game because I, I have done a a playthrough video on it beforehand. So good luck at entering that if you want to win a copy of Hamlet. If you are one of my patron supporters, you get extra entries into the contest as well. Right, so UK Games Expo. I leave tomorrow. Uh, Adam Richards is picking me up tomorrow afternoon and we're going to be driving up to Birmingham and I'm going to be there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So my rough plans, if you want to come and see me, are that I'm going to be demoing uh, Marrakesh and New York City at the Queen Games booth every morning from 9 o'clock till probably about 12, 30, 1 o'clock. Um, if, if you want to swing by, come by, say hello. Quite often people will come by and go, oh, Paul, you were busy, so I didn't want to interrupt you, okay? Please interrupt me, unless I'm literally in the middle of talking, um, because I will be there, I will be busy, but that doesn't mean you can't just wait for a moment and say, hi, Paul, just wanted to say hello. That's fine, that's fine. Please, please come along and, and say hello. But also, if you are one of my patron supporters, we are having various meetups. So first of all, uh, on the Thursday, uh, and I'll, I'll do a Patreon post about this probably tomorrow morning, um, but on the Thursday, uh, we're going to meet at Weatherspoons, and then we're probably going to go to the open gaming area and do some open gaming. Um, but on the Saturday night, and this isn't just a Patreon meetup, this is the Just One Live event. So this is my final shout out because really would like to sell a few more tickets for this. Um, I am doing a live show at the UK Games Expo. All money is going to charity. I'm going to be doing a prize giveaway as well. So please come along. If you are free on the Saturday night, it's £5 and all of that money goes to charity. Uh, eight o'clock, you need to have tickets in advance. You can buy them from the UK Games Expo website. Again, I'll put a link in the description of this video to that. So yes, come along on the Saturday night. There are still about 50 tickets left. Um, so it would be great if you could come along and support that. And then we're having a Patreon meetup after that. Right, so that's UK Games Expo. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much about it. Okay, right, next up, Patreon update. Let's talk about the Patreon update. So for, for various reasons, the last couple of weeks have seen a big rise in the number of Patreon supporters. Um, I'm filming this video, as I mentioned, on the very last day of May. So right now... Patreon support has gone up a lot in May and we are currently standing at 1,002 supporters, which for me is just mind-blowing, incredible. I mean, I remember when I launched the Patreon and I got to 200 supporters and I was like, oh my God, wow, I've got 200 people who are supporting me and, and now we've managed to reach 1,000. We're at 1,002. But... Before everybody gets too excited, what's going to happen is tomorrow is the 1st of June. And what happens, as I've mentioned in all of my other <laughs> monthly videos, at the start of the month, normally on the 1st or the 2nd of June, I will lose between 25 and 30 Patreon supporters. That's the way it goes. Everybody who has a Patreon has exactly the same problem. Um, it's because people's cards expire. And what happens is Patreon, the Patreon system is pretty flawed. And unfortunately, most of the time, it doesn't seem to send any messages out to anybody to say, you're a supporter of gaming rules. We weren't able to take any money from your account because your credit card has expired or something. But we're not going to tell you that. We're just going to assume that you're psychic and that you know about it. Uh, and unfortunately, that leaves it down to, down to me, the creator, to contact people and say, hope you don't mind me contacting you, but it, it's not been able to take payment. Now... Over the course of the month, usually about 50% of those people sort it out. Uh, either they knew about it or, you know, I told them about it or whatever. 
but we still lose every, everybody on patreon loses a certain percentage of people every month to that so whilst we are at 1002 now get the party hats out get the cake out celebration time it's going to drop down to about 975 in the next couple of days uh, and then hopefully it will slowly pick up again now 1002 is a is a is a massive milestone. A thousand is a massive milestone. Big thank you to Sally for getting me to a to a thousand. But there is one thing that I do want to mention here, and I did talk about this last month as well. Um, but I want to talk about it again because we've reached a thousand. And this is if you are one of those people watching this video and thinks, well, Paul's got a thousand supporters, let's compare his channel and his supporters. To some other people who also do a Patreon. And what I want to say is every content creator is different. Just because I've managed to get to a thousand Patreon supporters, I, I run my channel in a different way to other channels. So it's not fair really to compare them. So for example, at one end of the scale, you have content creators who do no sponsored videos. Literally, they don't get paid anything at all by anybody to make their videos and they rely on YouTube advertising and Patreon funding and they might do like product placement on some of their videos as well which I always find a bit weird but that's how they get their money and that's fine. There are other channels out there who do sponsored videos like mine whereas I, I will create some sponsored playthroughs or some sponsored how to plays or whatever but there are other channels out there who that is predominantly what they're doing. Eight out of 10 of their videos were paid for. And there's no problem with that whatsoever because that's the way I used to operate. You know, going back five, six, seven years ago, almost every video on my channel was paid for because that was my job. I didn't really have the Patreon. Well, I didn't have the Patreon at the time. So my only source of income was from that. And if, if a channel wants to do that, that's absolutely fine. I have no problem with that. And there are many channels out there that I am subscribe to, I am fans of, and I'm friends with, and most of the content they make is sponsored. No problem with that whatsoever. The way that I operate, I kind of sit somewhere in the middle. And what's happened is over the years, as the Patreon support has gone up, I have been doing less sponsored work. So right now, I think roughly speaking, I'm in about a 50-50 mix. And if we just go back to all of those videos that I talked about that I've done on the channel in the last month, Arkham Horror, four videos on that, not paid for. Star Wars Rebellion, not paid for. Outer Rim, not paid for. New York City was. Apex Legends was. War of the Three Sanchos was. Space Corp wasn't. War Room wasn't. Too Many Bones wasn't. Anachrony wasn't. The other ones I've played which weren't on the channel. So right now, if we look at the last month's content on my channel, three of the videos were sponsored. Oh, there was probably a how to play video in there as well. So let's make it four. Let's say four videos were sponsored and about seven or eight were not. Um, for me, it's, it's roughly 50-50. And I just wanted to say that, um, that, that that's just how it is. But a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters, not just the new ones, but all of the people who've been with me for many, many years. On screen now is a list of all of the people who started supporting me in May. So yeah, a big thank you to all of you. You have directly contributed to me helping make the 1000 uh, milestone. But as I say, I couldn't have done it without all of the existing patron supporters as well. So yeah, big thank you to you. Right. One of the reasons why I think in the last couple of weeks, there has been a boost in the patron support uh, has been because there's been a lot of controversy surrounding a particular YouTube channel uh, being accused of extortion with a publisher. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. Um, I, I, you know, many, many other channels have recorded videos specifically on this subject, and everybody who has has had tens of thousands of views. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, and I'm not going to talk about it in great detail here. Um, but I just wanted to say that it is the classic case of people's mentality these days, the human race, as we are now, is so easy to jump on people with pitchforks. And I'm not saying that people are not to blame. And I'm not saying that some people have not done something 
morally or ethically wrong, whether deliberate or not. But it's uncomfortable to see the amount of hostility against other human beings sometimes. Um, it's just, yeah. Now, I might, myself, I have my own personal feelings on the way that certain channels operate and I don't like the way that certain channels operate. That's my personal feeling. But I'm not going down that road of all of this anger and hatred and hostility. But to say that this has affected me, even though I'm not directly involved in any way at all, it has affected me. It has, it's affected me a lot because, and I, and, I, and I speak about this now and again, I suffer from a number of mental health issues, right? That, that's just a fact. Let's get that out there. So I react to certain things in a more extreme way than other people might. And what a lot of people might just brush off, laugh about, and then forget about, I lie in bed for hours and hours and hours stewing over in my mind about all of these things. My, my brain makes up a lot of stuff. My brain sends me down dark paths that make me reevaluate things. And even though it's nothing to do with me, all of a sudden it, it, it just, ah. So I've had a heck of a two weeks with allowing myself to get drawn into spending so much time and mental energy on this, even though I'm not directly affected by it. Um, finding out the details of how other channels are operating and specifically how much other channels are getting paid to produce content. Now, this isn't a jealousy thing. This isn't absolutely a jealousy thing. In fact, I have, you know, anybody who is able to start a channel and build it up from nothing to being able to ask for a huge amount of money for videos, that's something. That's great marketing. That's being a great salesperson. That's promoting yourself really well. And then you've got me, who's been doing this eight or nine years on my own, getting paid a fraction of that amount for a different type of video, but the same amount of work. So that's not made me feel great. That has absolutely dented my self-confidence. As I say, it's been, it's been a difficult couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about Aeon Trespass Odyssey, because the game at the centre of this controversy is a game called Aeon Trespass Odyssey that I had heard about. Some of my patron supporters had been talking about this game, uh, so I am aware of this game, and I was aware that it was a huge, epic campaign-style game with hundreds of hours of gameplay. There's lots of those games out there. This was just one of them. Uh, it was not, as I first suspected, an expansion set for Aeon's End. When I first heard the name, I thought, well, I love Aeon's End. Let's have a look at this. Wait a minute, this isn't Aeon's End. And they went, no, 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 this is a totally separate game. Um, but the publisher of Aeon Trespass Odyssey is in need of a content creator to create some videos to help people to play their game. And the content creator that they were planning to use for these videos, things didn't quite work out with that. And I have the opportunity that I might be that person. Now, they have sent me a copy of the game. It arrived yesterday. I did an unboxing video of it last night. If you want to see me unboxing it last night, I did a, a one hour unboxing video last night where I talk about it. But a lot of people are very excited about the fact that I might be producing content for this game. I am in discussions with the publisher and I will let you know. I need to I need to have some real good discussions with them about exactly what content they want, when they want it. Um, because a lot of you might be thinking, well, why wouldn't you, Paul? You know, certainly if you if you can charge you know, a good amount of money, you are a great person for doing a rules video for this game because it's a super complicated game. It's something like 4.7 weight on BGG or something. Um, you're the best person to do a rules video for this game because you do, you cover heavy games. 
you'll get the rules right and you'll be great for it. Why wouldn't you do it? Well, the reason why I wouldn't do it is because I'm not sure I'm going to have time to fit it in. Covering a game like that, I mean, the Frosthaven video took me 130 or 120 hours of work and I already knew how to play the game. Um, the rules videos that I create are exceptionally time intensive um, and you know, I would love to. If, I, if my cloning machine was working, I would absolutely love to say, yep, no problem. I'll, I'll do your videos. When do you want them? Next week? Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll get them knocked out. I simply don't have that amount of time. And this goes back to what I was saying about the Patreon. Because I generally spend about 50% of my time producing non-sponsored content, and I spend 50% of my time producing sponsored content, a lot of people don't realize that I do a lot of other stuff in the background as well. I do a lot of game development with publishers. I do, I'm going to be doing some rule book seminars for, uh, for one particular publisher that are paying me to essentially run uh, a series of seminars for them on how to write better rule books. I'm doing a lot of stuff in the background uh, that doesn't go unseen. And this is where I, this is where I find sometimes I lose out compared to other channels that are purely just video after video after video after video. And I'm like, I'm, I'm jealous of them. I'm like, how are you getting time to make all of these videos? And then I look at what I've done today and I think, oh yeah, I've done that and I've done that and I've worked an 11 hour day and I've done, I've got no videos to show for it, but I've still worked really hard that day. Um, anyway, we will find out. We'll find out. I will, I will let you know on here and I will let my supporters know uh, how the discussions with the publisher goes and we'll see. So one thing I do want to talk about is changes to the channel. So another thing that I've been putting off for about a year, I've decided to do. And I, I and what gave me the encouragement and the motivation to do it is this, this current controver controversial situation while I'm lying there in the middle of the night thinking, what can I do about my channel? How can I, how can I make my channel better? One of the things that a number of people have said to me in the past is that live videos don't work with the YouTube algorithm. A lot of people who have tried to do live streams have said that their live streams get a fraction of the views that an uploaded video would do. I mean, we're talking maybe a quarter or a fifth or something like that. So I've decided that I've, I'm, I'm experimenting and for the next month or two, I am changing the way that the channel works and that change has already been implemented as I've mentioned. So if we just scroll back, War Room, it didn't go out live to the public. Okay, that was, it went out live to Patreon supporters. And then afterwards, I took the video down, edited it a bit, re-uploaded it. Too Many Bones, Automaton, Automaton of Shale was recorded and went out live to Patreon supporters on the 25th of May. I've taken the video down. I've chopped off the start and the end. That's going up later today. Anachrony did the same. People came round. It went out live streamed to Patreon supporters on the 26th. It's going live to the public uh, this Friday. So this is what I'm planning to do. Apart from the Arkham Horror streams, which are apps, which are actually live, my plan moving forward for the next couple of months is the videos will be live streamed, but only to Patreon supporters. And then what will happen is I will take the video down, edit it a slight amount, and then re-upload it as a new video. Now, just want to talk about this for a minute. I am not doing this to try and get more patron supporters. I am not doing this to say, oh, you get to watch it live if you're a patron supporter. It's like, no, no, no. The way that my recording system works is it's all done live anyway. The reason why I'm not sending it live to the public is for two or three reasons. The first one being that the main one being that the YouTube algorithm doesn't like live videos and therefore my videos are not getting recommended, which means me people are not seeing them. Also, the number of people that I do have watching live is about 20 to 25 people. And it's been 20 to 25 people for the last two or three years. My live audience has not grown. Uh, and whilst it's always nice to have a live audience, the number of views that I get on my video is 95% of the views, if not more, come from people watching it afterwards. So it's not actually going to affect, if most people are watching it back afterwards anyway, then it's not going to change that. People can still watch it back afterwards. It's just on a different link than it was earlier, but it's still there. It's still on the channel. Um, 
Also, it allows me that if something goes wrong in the video, I can fix it. So if the doorbell goes and I have to go downstairs and get something. Um, it's more important for sponsored streams. If it's a sponsored stream, then I can edit out any bits that I don't want in. If it's not a sponsored stream, I probably wouldn't edit out when I went downstairs and got the door, if the doorbell rang, because actually editing a video afterwards for a, for a two hour video takes me about six or seven hours. And I don't have time for that if it's not a sponsored stream. So when I say editing, it's literally just chopping off the start, chopping off the end and re-uploading it as a new video. The downside being any chat that happened during the video, which I no longer have on screen. I don't know if you've noticed, but for the last few weeks, I've turned off the on-screen chat. Uh, it means the chat will not be there whatsoever. So, you know, in YouTube, you get the chat on the right hand side of the window. It won't be there. It's just one of the downsides. Anyway, let me know what you think. Um, we'll see how it goes. I'm curious to see how many people um, are bothered by that. Right, next up, let's talk about what's coming up soon. So I've already mentioned that today, the Too Many Bones Automaton of Shale video is gonna go live. And on Friday, the Anachrony playthrough is gonna go live. When I get back from UK Games Expo, I am gonna be finishing editing the Marrakesh how to play video which I was hoping to have finished already. But unfortunately, I got distracted with other things for the last week. So yeah, the Marrakesh How to Play video, uh, which is the fourth game in the Steffenfeld City Collection, and the game that I'm going to spend most of UK Games Expo demoing to people, that's going to go live when I get back. Uh, well, I'm going to finish it, and then it's going to go live. Also, on the Tuesday, 6th of June, the day after I get back from Expo, not the day after I get back, the Tuesday, um, I'm going to be doing a live stream, and this is actually live, public live, not Patreon only live, uh, of a new escape room style game, which is coming from Board and Dice later this year. They have sent me a mystery box. It's arrived. I've put a post, of, a picture of it up on uh, Facebook this morning, and I'll put a picture in this video right now. This arrived, and I will be doing a live playthrough of it on the 6th of June. I say playthrough, I I don't know. It's a puzzle game and we've got to, so basically we're going to solve puzzles together uh, and we're going to try and get into the box. And this is basically a, a teaser type video for a new set of escape room style games that Board and Dice are releasing later this year. So that's coming up next week. There will be more Arkham Horror. We will be continuing to play Arkham Horror. We've probably got about three or four sessions left. Um, so that'll be happening. I'm also background work, but the next set of unlock. So unlock box set number 11, that is due to arrive next week. Uh, I get sent all of the files, we print them out uh, and we basically test them all. So that, that's gonna be happening. You're not gonna see any of that on the channel. That's background work for me, but I just wanted to let you know that the next unlock box set, I am gonna be doing the testing and editing for that next week. Um, Draft and write records from Inside Up Games. This is a sponsored playthrough. I will be doing that uh, the Friday I get back from Expo. Uh, so this will be the 9th. And this will be one which will be live streamed to Patreon supporters. Uh, and Inside Up Games will be watching along in the chat as well, just to make sure we don't make any mistakes. It's a, it's a draft and write game that takes about 45 to 60 minutes with the theme that you're making a record and trying to make the best record, as far as I know. Um, so that, that'll be going out live to patron supporters on the 9th of June, and then I'll be editing and uploading it later. Voidfall is the big job for the next month. As I mentioned, a copy of the game will be arriving tomorrow. I will be doing two learning playthrough videos of it, which will be behind the scenes videos for patron supporters. I'll be doing one on Tabletop Simulator, which I think is happening on Wednesday the 7th of June. Uh, and then JP and Steven are coming over on Monday the 12th and we're going to be playing the physical game. They are not ever going to be made public. They are me learning how to play the game in preparation for me creating the video, but I will be live streaming them to Patreon supporters as a as a behind the scenes bonus. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be doing Voidfall, which is going to take me forever because it's a massive game. I'm also going to be covering Princes of Florence. Now, Princes of Florence is one of the first solid proper Euro games that I played back in 2000. Um, and it's got a new version, and WizKids are the distributor for the English language version of this game. WizKids are one of my clients. They contacted me and said, would you like to do a playthrough video of Princes of Florence? And I said, absolutely 100% yes, without any question whatsoever, because I love Princes of Florence. 
uh, and it's a fantastic game, and I've played it lots. There you go. Let's get all my personal feelings about the game out. But that is going to be a sponsored playthrough video, during which I will not tell you how amazing the game is. But, uh, yeah. And, and you know, WizKids are just the, the publisher of the English language version of the new edition. They didn't design the game or anything like this. So, yeah. Um, and then, and this is very exciting, but this won't be streamed on the channel, but I'm going to be doing it. Um, Vicky's got her Hendu on the 24th of June. So I've got to leave the house. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going around to a friend of mine's house, I'm going around to Mark's house, and we're going to be playing Terraforming Marses, where we play Terraforming Mars with multiple maps at the same time using as many expansions as we can have. So that's going to be fun. Uh, also, Terraforming Mars again, but this time Ares Expedition Crisis Expansion Solo Mode coming to the channel end of June. Sometime around the end of June, I will be doing a sponsored playthrough for uh, Stronghold Games Stroke Indie Game Studios of the Crisis Expansion Mode for Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. And finally, on the last day of June, I will be doing a playthrough of Trials of Tempest, which is a new D&D uh, themed game from WizKids. That is another sponsored playthrough video. So, yeah, that's, that's it. Um, now, there is also... I'm not sure when I'm going to do the vlog. Um, if I do the vlog at the end of June, it might even be before Trials of Tempest. But if I don't do the next vlog until the start of July, then I will have I, I will have missed mentioning the fact that on the 1st of July, I am hosting a birthday weekend, because it's my birthday on the 3rd of July. So on the 1st of July, I've got a whole lot of friends coming over. I'm having a birthday games day. But on the very start of that day, at 10 o'clock in the morning... I'm going to be doing a live stream of fighting fantasy adventures designed by Martin Wallace. It's just been announced, but Martin Wallace has got the rights to publish a fighting fantasy style game, and I've got the opportunity to cover it. And when Cassie, who's the marketing person for Wallace uh, Designs, contacted me and said, Martin's designed a fighting fantasy game, would you be interested in covering it on the channel? I went back to her and I said, here are links to all of the fighting fantasy games that I've already played on the channel. I am assuming you didn't know how much of a fan I am of the fighting fantasy books. And she said, no, I didn't. So you'd be the perfect fit for this game. Yes, absolutely. So 1st of July, 10 o'clock in the morning, and this will be an open public live stream. I will be covering Martin Wallace's new fighting fantasy adventures game. Very exciting. There's, there was always exciting stuff to talk about. Um... Right, just to wrap things up before we finish, just a quick touch on the personal stuff. I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who has reached out to me, both in the comments of uh, last month's video or on messages on groups or messages that people have sent me privately. Um, I did talk about my difficulties with uh, my current mental health situation a lot in the last video. Um, and I really appreciate everybody who's reached out to me, uh, you know, personally about that. I would say that the last month has been better. I mean, somebody like me is never going to be fixed in a way. Um, and even in the last month, there's been good spells and last spells. And I and I go on, you know, I go from, you know, being really, really enthusiastic one day to being so down in the dumps that I can't bring myself to get out of bed um, some days. So yeah. Um, and the whole controversy thing, as I mentioned earlier on, that has affected me in more ways than I would like. But I'm positive about a number of things. Um, and, and I wrote this before I went to the dentist. <laughs> I'm still positive about a number of things, even though I'm still in quite a lot of pain. Um, so yeah, we'll see how we get on. But lots to look forward to in the next month. As I say, if you are going to UK Games Expo, please stop by. Please say hello. Please come along to the Just One Show if you can. We're raising money for charity. Tickets are still available. Uh, and also a big thank you again to all of my patron supporters, because without you, not only this video is not possible, but right now, pretty much everything that I do, uh, I mean, if I didn't have the patron support that I have, I would end up having to do different things. And I know that I wouldn't enjoy those things as much as what I'm doing at the moment. All of these live streams that I do or all of these videos that I do that are not paid for, uh, that are funded through Patreon and Patreon supporters get to vote on what games we're going to be covering on the channel. That's really good. I really like that. Um, so yeah, so big thank you 
to everybody for your support. That's everything. As always, if you're not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel, click the little bell, do the like thing and all of that lot. But let me know what you think. Any of the games that I've talked about in this video, any of the games that you really like, any of the games you dislike, just let me know. Leave me comments. I try and reply to most of the comments that I can. Yeah, right. I'm going to disappear now and get this video edited ready for tomorrow. So until next time, take care and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.